I'm Vinny Politan. Welcome to Closing Arguments. Great to have you with us tonight. And here we are, uh, you know, a day after the dramatic verdict in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Derek Chauvin, as you know, convicted all the charges. So tonight I want to take a little time to, to, to look a little bit ahead as to what is next. And, and let's start with uh, his new mugshot. Let's take a look at Derek Chauvin, what he looks like now as a convicted murderer. Uh, same look on his face, a little more hair than his, his last mugshot. Uh, but this is now uh, going to be a big part of his life, wearing an orange suit. Uh, and, and one of the questions is, how long? Uh, he is staying right now at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Oak Park Heights. Let's take a look. We've got that as well for you tonight. Um, and apparently in a, in a single cell. So um, you have some idea of where he is. Think about the, the change in life from going as a police officer to now someone behind bars. And the, and the big question is, um, what is the punishment going to be here? How long will he be behind bars in a cell? And there's a lot of discretion that the judge has in this case. A lot of discretion. Now, when I was a prosecutor, um, Friday was sentencing day, and we would get a stack of files like this, uh, and it was just case after case after case. Now, none of these murder cases, um, but, you know, robberies, burglaries, drug distribution, things like that. And, you know, sometimes you would, you would look at the, um, the history of the criminal defendant because that is a huge factor when it comes to sentencing, is what is the, who is this person? Not what they did, but who are they? Who were they before they committed this crime? And so many times I would get in front of a judge and I'd hold up a rap sheet like this and it would drop down to the floor. And I would hear criminal defense attorneys on the other side saying, yes, Your Honor, he has 12 arrests, but only three convictions. And the judge would be like, oh, only three convictions. And defendants like that would get a break. And, and I was, you know, I'm fresh out of law school, uh, beginning as, as, a, as a prosecutor, and I'm just shocked looking at the way our, our system was working. I was like, this is amazing that people get second, third, fourth, and fifth chances in front of judges who will give them the benefit of the doubt. Oh, they need, they need a drug program. Oh, maybe we put them on probation. And again, these aren't murder cases, but these are criminal defendants with long histories that uh, would get that second, third, fourth, fifth chance. Then when there was one who had no prior criminal history, it would be like, oh my goodness, there was no way, there was no way, unless it was mandatory, that that defendant would be, would be put behind bars. Again, not murder cases, but for burglaries and, and other, other, other uh, cases like that, drug cases, um, they were just treated differently. Criminal defendants who came in front of these judges who had no criminal history, it was like, wow, all right, so, all right, this is your first time, so, you know, we give you the benefit of the doubt. So now we come back to Derek Chauvin. Um, this is his first criminal offense. It's a big, big one. It's a doozy. It's second-degree murder. Um, but how exactly will he be treated? This judge has a lot of discretion. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who is in Minneapolis, Minnesota tonight with us. Um, let's first, I want to put up on the screen what the maximum is for all of the charges, the three convictions in this case. Uh, second degree murder, 40 years. Third degree uh, murder, 25 years. And second degree manslaughter, 10 years. Um, how will the judge deal with those charges? Uh, these, I, I presume, will somehow merge. Uh, Julia? Well, he's first going to get briefs from both sides. He is going to be uh, waiting to hear what the state's arguments are going to be, what the defense's arguments are going to be, and then there are these aggravating factors that he has to deal with. So we're looking ahead to eight weeks out that the sentencing is actually going to be scheduled for, but we don't know yet exactly what the attorney general's office is going to be recommending as what they want as a sentence for Derek Chauvin. Now, um, under the Minnesota sentencing guidelines for second degree murder, which is the top charge, uh, the presumptive sentence is 150 months, 12 and a half years. So um, give us some perspective on, on how they get there and why when the maximum is 40, uh, the presumptive is only 12 and a half years. 
Well, they look at a grid. So the grid goes from whatever the minimum is all the way up to the 40 years in prison. But they're also looking at his criminal history. So that grid starts on the very low end, which 12.5 years is at the zero of criminal history. And we know Derek Chauvin doesn't have a criminal history. So he's going to get under the sentencing guidelines the lowest recommended sentence under the Minnesota sentencing guidelines. And then those who have multiple offenses going up to three, four, five, six, that's when you get to 40 years as would be under the guidelines. But in Minnesota, there was a filing, or rather the state in this case, state of Minnesota filed a notice of aggravating factors that they wanted the court, the jury to consider to do an upward departure, to go outside of what the sentencing guidelines are, which again, the 12.5 years is that presumptive sentence. And there's a range where a judge has discretion from 10 years to 15 years. They can go the low end or the higher end for someone who's in that category of no criminal history. Uh, but the upward departure would get outside of that range and allow the judge to go up to 40 if he so chooses. And this, again, will be in the discretion of Judge Cahill. I mean, th and this is a lot of discretion we're talking about um, with the potential of 40 years, a uh, presumption of, of 12 and a half. I mean, basically, the way I'm looking at it, Judge Cahill uh, has a, a, a lot of um, influence here into what the rest of Derek Chauvin's life is going to be like. Ultimately, and Derek Chauvin really put more of that uh, ability into the judge's hand because he had the opportunity under Blakely to have a jury decide whether or not there are aggravating factors to allow the judge to have that upward departure and be able to get outside what the guidelines are in Minnesota. But he waived that right at the end of the case. He had not heard back from the jury as far as the conviction. He waived his right to a jury deciding those aggravating factors. So it's going to be up to the judge on whether or not, first of all, he can even make that upward departure because the aggravating factors exist and what the actual final sentence is going to be. And we took a look at his, um, his cell at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Oak Park Heights. So, I mean, this is a police officer behind bars. Uh, have they given us any information about whether he'll have interaction with other inmates? He's in what's called administrative segregation. And this facility that he's in, the Oak Park Heights uh, Correctional Facility, is one of the most secure in Minneapolis, and the unit that he's in is the most secure. So he's in a maximum security facility, the only one in the state, and he is outside of the general population of that prison. He does not interact with any other inmates and People who are put in this kind of custody are there because there is a safety concern related to them. And, you know, I look at that, you know, it's two ways. It's almost like being on death row. Death row, they're segregated. They don't have that, that type of interaction. And for many inmates, they want to have that interaction because they're still living a life. It's a different life than you and I, but it's a life where they can socialize and do things. But for Derek Chauvin, I don't think he wants that. As, as being Derek Chauvin, the man who murdered George Floyd... I don't think you want to be in the general population inside the prison. Not right now, at least. You know, we don't know how long that type of security is going to last. He is there awaiting sentencing. I don't know if that's going to be where he is ultimately going to serve out his sentence. In some states, the uh, Department of Corrections makes a decision on where that person ultimately serves out their time. But uh, in this case, and for right now, as far as we know, he's in that facility. And that's the one that he was transferred to when he was first charged, because he was in a jail, the Hennepin County Jail. And then for his security, he was transferred to a prison, which we typically only see in people who are already convicted. Even awaiting sentencing, people typically stay inside the jail until they are fully sentenced and then transferred. But because of that security at that correctional facility, that's where he is. Yeah, and jails are a mishmash. I mean, because you've got a, a mixture of low-level offenders and people who are awaiting uh, disposition of their cases. So you could have murderers and, and folks can, uh, you know, charged with DUI. It's such a mixture inside uh, jails. Now, there was an original plea deal that we heard about, and one of the conditions was he wanted to serve his time in federal prison, but did not, and but wanted to make sure that the feds would not go after him, but serve his state time in federal prison. 
Am I re remembering that right? That third degree plea deal, third degree murder that he was going to cop to back in uh, May, June of 2020, right after this happened. This was uh, going on between the prosecution here locally in Minneapolis and the attorney representing Derek Chauvin at the time. And uh, ultimately, they uh, came to an agreement, according to those sources who were close to the matter. They said that he was going to take that third degree and accept 10 years in prison, but he wanted to make sure that that federal investigation was going to be included. And at the time, Attorney General uh, William Barr said, no, that's not something that we're going to agree to. And ultimately, the case continued on to the point that it is now. He's convicted of that top count of second degree unintentional murder. Yeah, looking at that now, that was a good deal. All right, let, let's bring our special guests into our conversation tonight. Uh, joining us tonight, Judge Gino Brogdon and wrongful death attorney and the co-counsel for the families of Trayvon Martin and Andre Hill, Natalie Jackson is with us as well. Uh, great to see you both. All right, got to start with the judge tonight, La you, Natalie. Man. Sorry, got to start with the judge. Um, I defer to Judge Brogdon. <laughs> uh, judge, this is a lot of discretion for Judge Cahill when it comes to upward departure, um, you know, up to 40 years, a presumptive of 12 and a half. You've got a criminal defendant with no prior history. Um, and you've got the world watching and waiting uh, as to what he's going to do. Uh, put us in his shoes. How much, how, much, how much pressure is on the judge now? It is immeasurable, Vinny, the pressure on this judge. Uh, one of the most difficult parts of being a trial judge is sentencing because the, the general purpose of sentencing is punishment and deterrence. But how do you know whether 40 years, 70 years, which one is more just? And if it was that simple, the judge could simply do the math. The reality is, is that that litany of factors that you just read or, or spilled out uh, in terms of the world watching, it makes it very public. I don't know if this judge is elected, but if he is like I was, and he's elected every four or six years, he's also got to think about a personal backlash in that way. Now, he's got to also take into consideration the pre-sentence reports from the prosecution and the defense. Now, if the prosecution asks for the maximum, that is 75 years, 40, 25, and 10, it, it gives the judge a little bit of breathing room as to why he, he uh, uh, upgrades the uh, uh, sentence. But uh, if the prosecution recommends less, which I don't think is very likely, it would be tough to go beyond what the prosecution recommends. There's a, there's a world of pressure on the judge, and uh, I'm sure he's feeling it, uh, even as we see him in this camera. Uh Natalie, I know you, you represent a lot of victims, and I know the, uh, George Floyd's family, they, they want the maximum. They absolutely want the maximum. Uh, it's, it's a murder conviction. Uh, they saw the murder happen. It's recorded. The world saw it. Um, what do you see as justice here? I mean, should, should he be treated differently than any other first-time, second-degree murderer? I think justice would be, and I'm not speaking for the Floyd family because they lost a family member. And I'm, you know, taking into consideration children also saw this murder. So I would think that justice in this case would be what Judge Cahill would do to any defendant in the same position and what he has done previously to defendants in the same position. Uh, a judge, let me let me ask you. This is a high-profile case, um, but you know this is a defendant, and, and I, I said this in the beginning because I was shocked when I first became a prosecutor. Um, how many chances uh, criminal defendants get, and 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 judges, because they they see it day in and day out, and they they tr they try to be hopeful and they try to give people chances. Uh, this is a first-time offender. It's a doozy, second degree, obviously. Um, do you, how, how do you see this? Do you see this as that's a factor that should be considered heavily? Or is it the nature of what happened, uh, you know, tips the scales away from the fact that he's never committed a crime or been convicted of a crime before? He's not like another defendant who would have simply no history. That is, they're convicted of a murder, but before this 
uh, case we had never heard of him before. Derek Chauvin is very, very different. And you got to understand that the judge is human. The judge sat through the gory details of this trial. The judge knows things that the jury didn't know. For example, the scores of complaints and offenses that uh, Derek Chauvin uh, managed to amass in his career as a police officer, the judge will know about that. But in addition to the bad stuff, the judge will take into account his age, take into account maybe he's done community service somewhere, maybe his lawyers will come up with something that, that humanizes him and strikes a chord of compassion with the judge. But the judge is going to look at him very different from the average first-time offender. Uh, you know, this case really illustrates the uh, chance you take when you pass up a plea, which is what these other three officers will be facing. Uh, Derek Chauvin passed up a plea, and the reason a judge can accept a plea early is they haven't heard the full autopsy of the case. I used to tell people, here's what I will accept. But if I hear the facts, my mind could change about what the punishment would be. And this judge, I'm certainly after this trial, is very different in his mindset about what the punishment should be from what he thought when a, a plea was possible. Julie, Janae, what role do we do we know what role the, the family will play in any of this? Will they have an opportunity to speak in court or um, have we learned that yet? We've learned from attorneys who are here in Minneapolis who tell us how things are typically done, that the judge can receive letters from the family of the victim and will uh, whether or not it's going to be taken into consideration for the sentencing, but we'll read those letters and they likely will be able to speak in a victim impact statement sort of way. But there has not been a scheduling order yet to tell us exactly when the date of this hearing is going to be. And we know that those briefs are going to be filed first. So that's due in six weeks. There's a pre-sentencing investigation that's going on. Derek Chauvin will likely be interviewed. There could be a psych evaluation that is ordered if it's requested. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are going to happen before that sentencing hearing is actually going to take place. Uh, Natalie Jackson, what are your thoughts as someone who represents victims uh, again? Um, I, what role should they I, play during sentencing? Oh, I definitely think vict the victim's um, relatives and family members should be heard. Uh, this case has been all about justice and people calling for equal justice. Um, the justice to not be shot on the street, to have an opportunity to go to trial, not be not be choked, hold, and killed on the street, and have that opportunity to go to trial. The justice where a police officer will be seen the same as any other defendant that is de that is facing a trial. Now we're talking about the sentencing and what will happen there. I think that people want to see a just outcome, and justice is where no one is treated differently because of their rank or their race. Julie, today, you know, we really didn't learn much about Derek Chauvin during the course of this trial. Obviously, he didn't testify. Um, no one spoke on his behalf. Uh, what do we know about the life that he led uh, up until this point? Well, one thing I wanted to bring up that's not a conviction yet, but he is also simultaneously to this case facing tax evasion charges. They were stayed as far as the litigation until the end of this trial. So that's still something that he will either have to answer for or uh, the attorneys there in Washington County, which is near to here, they'll figure out what to do with that case because it's something that he's facing along with his wife, Kelly Chauvin, who divorced him not too long after, filed for divorce, not too long after the death of George Floyd. We know he was a longtime police officer and that he uh, did a lot of off-duty work, real estate behind the scenes, owned a home in Florida. We did not get to hear much of that during not only the trial, but even the closing arguments or opening statements from his attorney. Uh, but he is someone who uh, was a senior ranking and training officer there on the force with the Minneapolis Police Department. I'll tell you what will be interesting to see who, if anyone, comes into court to speak on his behalf, whether there'll be any fellow police officers, family members, ex-wife, uh, who's going to speak for Derek Chauvin. We'll continue to follow all of this. 
Uh, Julie Janae uh, is going to uh, rejoin us at the top of the hour. Uh, she's been digging into some details regarding uh, this whole sentencing procedure, uh, as well as uh, some other things taking place out in Minneapolis. We'll check back with you. Judge Gino Brogdon and Natalie Jackson will stay with us. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the other case happening in Minnesota that happened in the middle of the trial, the, the police shooting of Dante Wright. Today was a public viewing. We've got some new video to take a look at, and uh, we'll see what the judge and Natalie Jackson have to say about that case next.